The public is very familiar with the Terracotta Army, this arrangement of thousands of warriors that were buried in China just over 2,000 years ago. They are a small component of a much larger mausoleum, the mausoleum that Emperor Qin Shi Huangdi, the first emperor of China, had built for himself. So it's a much larger construction on site. It's over 50 square kilometers. It's the size of a small city. And the warriors are just one satellite component that's there to protect the emperor in his afterlife. When we think of the manufacture of anything that's being made on a very large scale, that's made of multiple components and that has to be very highly standardized, be them cars or terracotta warriors with their weapons, we tend to envision a large production chain that's split in smaller, highly specialized units, each of which is producing a component. And these may be in separate locations. So there's one factory producing engines, the other one gearboxes, the other one braking systems. And these different parts join one another in the flow line production sequence, so that there are then other experts who, or specialists who put them together, others who then add the finishing touches and so on. And that's the idea that we, most of us, associate with large-scale standardized production. And this, is, this was our initial assumption when we approached the Terracotta Army. Having conducted the chemical, statistical and metrical analysis of a large number of the 40,000 bronze weapons that appear with the Terracotta Army, we are now quite confident that the production model was not a long, massive production chain, but rather that the model of production was around smaller cellular workshops. It's what we, what we call today Toyotism. Basically, there are smaller production units, and in each of those you have all the resources you need, all the expertise, all the knowledge, all the tools to produce finished items. So they are much more highly skilled, the engineers, the workers in that particular unit, but they are also more versatile. Toyota, the modern car maker, has uh, done a great labor in developing this system as an organizational model that may actually be more efficient than the more traditional flow line production that we associate to Fordism. Basically, Toyota engineers are on average more highly skilled, more autonomous, and so these smaller cells can turn out whatever car is needed at any given time. So they produce in a system that's known as just-in-time, they avoid waste, they don't need to overstock, they just produce whatever is needed as it is needed. But this would also have been useful for the Terracotta Army. Let's not forget that this is the first ever Terracotta Army. It was totally impossible for them to know how many warriors they're going to need, how many arrows, how long it's going to take, and therefore having an adaptable workforce is going to make this much easier. We are convinced that there may have been quite a few of these working in parallel, all to the same standards, but all of them working at the same time. Then, if there's a breakdown in one of them, the others can continue working or even change activity to replace this. Because when you're creating the Terracotta Army, they are all so tightly packed information that all the work has to progress at the same time because once you've placed an arrangement of a row of warriors, you cannot then go back to fit a sword that you have now finished. The sword has to be ready at the same time as the warrior, so they can all be placed harmoniously at the same time in the pit, so that the work can move forward. But what's perhaps most impressive is when we look at the surface of any of these arrowheads under the scanning electron microscope. And what we find is a pattern like this. We are looking at about one millimeter across here. And what we see is this arrangement of extremely shallow but perfectly parallel and very densely packed marks. And these are the marks that you've got in your kitchen knives. They are the diagnostic marks of something that has been sharpened using a rotary device, a polishing wheel, if you like, a sharpening wheel. This is interesting as an anecdote because this is the earliest instance that we have found of the industrial systematic use of a rotary sharpening wheel. But perhaps it's also interesting at a different level because it does show that no efforts or resources were spared in the construction of the Terracotta Army. We're looking at the smallest unimportant item, those tiny tips of the arrowheads that are going to be buried anyway, 
but effort is placed in making sure that every one of them is perfectly sharp and lethal.